itself was observed uh, almost 500 years ago, uh, that learning should always be an arduous and uncomfortable procedure. <laughs> so we recommend this evening as an indication of great dedication to something, particularly to the weather. Cheer up, when we get our new place, we'll have nice, clean places for everyone. And it looks a little nearer. I had some good reports today. This evening, we are beginning a series of five discussions on the philosophy of Paracelsus, especially as this relates to his principal concern in life, the treatment of disease. First of all, certain orientation, I think, is appropriate. The entire story of Paracelsus is part of the tremendous transition period uh, which we know as having followed closely upon the Renaissance and the Reformation. Harrison, a great authority on the history of medicine, says that in this period the great moving spirits were Luther in theology, Vesalius in anatomy, Paré in surgery, and Paracelsus in therapy. This gives us perhaps as good a summary as we can have. To begin with, then, this man, who had really a rather formidable name, Philippus Aurelius Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. No one cared to worry about it, so they finally decided to call him Paracelsus. Actually, the name Paracelsus means greater than Celsus. And whether this modest man bestowed it upon himself, or whether, as some suspect, his father bestowed it upon him, as a result of his early philosophy in medicine, he probably will never know. He was a remarkable man in many respects. He studied medicine with his father, who was a physician and surgeon associated with the order of the Teutonic Knights. His mother had a very remarkable position in society for her time. She was the superintendent of a hospital. And women were not generally superintendents of hospitals in 1490. Paracelsus was born the year before Columbus discovered America, born in 1491. And his brief and troublous life terminated about his 51st year. The exact reason and cause for his death is also unknown. His enemies declared that he died of drunken brawl. His friend said that he was pushed off a cliff by hired assassins of the medical fraternity. You can have your choice. From the feeling of the time, the assassination theory would have been well in the spirit of the attitude uh, which organized science held regarding him. Paracelsus was one of those persons who could not fit in. He was a complete and rugged individual. In his early life, he declined completely to conform with any traditional procedure. He was hopelessly disillusioned with the medical faculty of the University of Basel, although he later returned and lectured there. He declared in public that the soft down on the back of his neck knew more about the practice of medicine than the entire faculty of the University of Basel. <laughs> Obviously, this would have endeared him to his scientific contemporaries. His life tells us one very interesting story. He was one of the most complete empirics that we know in learning. Practically everything that he learned, he learned personally, by experience. And his conclusions and opinions were based upon the things that had personally happened to himself. In a day which was largely dominated by traditional forms and by a profoundly traditional scientific structure built upon the writings of Galen and Avicenna, Paracelsus 
departed from practically every recognized landmark. In early life, he followed medicine, even as a very young man, engaging in various medical activities with his parents. Later, he became deeply interested in religion, and learning of the researches of the celebrated ab abbot, Frithheim, abbot of Sponheim, he went there and studied with him for a number of years. This learned abbot was dedicated to alchemy, not merely the materialistic transmutation of metals, but the secret of the spirit of elements. With the abbot of Sponheim, he not only gained a profound knowledge of chemistry, but he also gained a deep understanding of scripture. The abbot was a man of tremendous intellectual capacity, and as a result of his long association with this learned man, Paracelsus is said to have reached a condition in which he could quote any verse of the Old or New Testament upon request. He had memorized the entire Bible. Now this had its practical uh, value. At one period in his career, discouraged in his scientific researches, he became a Bible salesman, wandered about Europe selling Bibles to make a living. He was not interested primarily in selling Bibles, he was interested primarily in wandering all over Europe, studying, meeting people, working with every class of human being that he could contact. He spent months with gypsies. He visited the old widow women that lived in their little cottages at the edge of town and dried their herbs and temples. He cultivated midwives. He learned everything that he could of the primitive beliefs of people, of the simple medical recipes and formulas that had been handed down in areas where no physician had ever practiced. Uh, and this he established a precedent that was to survive even till now. For the last two or three years, we have sent medical expeditions to the most remote parts of primitive countries to investigate their remedial practices. And are discovering that most of these practices are founded upon well established experimental basis. A little later, Saratosis turned to another activity. He went out as a kind of physician and general superintendent into the mining districts of the Pyrrhus. Here for many years he spent much of his time underground, working with the miners, studying the origin of metals, developing his knowledge of metallurgy, mining, and through his association with the great mining families of Tugas, he increased his knowledge on many other subjects. Later he went to the Netherlands, and was made army surgeon, going with the army into war. As army surgeon, his principal problem was to amputate arms and legs. He did this in the traditional manner of the time, cauterizing with a red hot iron. Anesthesia, things of this kind totally unknown. After nearly twenty years of wandering, he began to organize his findings. And he added to many, many other accomplishments a line of basic thinking which was later to distinguish him and to be associated with his name wherever it is mentioned on a philosophical level. Namely, he became a devout student of Neoplatonism. He followed largely in the footsteps of Pythagoras of Samos and of Plato of Athens. He was also deeply interested in the Neoplatonic philosophy of Plotinus, Proclus, and the so-called legitimate descendants of the great Platonic school, uh, descendants of branched off from Euclid, the nephew of Plato. As a Neoplatonist, Paracelsus developed the great framework of the philosophy which he was later to develop, or to perfect, perhaps as no other position, ever achieved such perfection. We do not know today clearly what Paracelsus contributed to the pharmacopoeia 
or to the general knowledge of medicine. We know that he experimented very heavily with the mercurial, that he was among the first uh, to develop uh, health methods, natural methods for the correction of disease. In fact, he was um, persecuted bitterly. They tried to collect the bill because he had not given the patient a lab of drugs. He had told the patient to take a bath, keep warm, watch his diet, and then sent the bill. The patient recovered but refused to pay because he hadn't received uh, what the medical profession at that time would regard as an elegant treatment. He, uh, he was too simple, too caustic, uh, too sharp in his way and thinking. These were all points held strongly against him. The writings of Paracelsus, like his public lectures, were given in Swiss German, in uh, a kind of low German which he insisted, however, was not nearly as low as the Latin of that particular period. That is a time in which, without any use of profanity or a nasty word, we had what was called formally, classically, and in the dictionary, bastard Latin. It was a corruption beyond human conception. And several of the early editions of the Bible published in it were so bad that the original editors couldn't read the text. Paracelsus also pointed out that by mumbling Latin in a learned way, you can conceal a vast amount of ignorance. <laughs> and uh, he also took it for granted that every person, man, woman, and child, from the peasant to the prince, was entitled to understand the principles of therapy. Therefore, you should teach not in the language of a chosen few, but in the argo of the people, so that the average listener could gain principles by which he could guard his own health or help to restore it if it had been affected. Paracelsus also pointed out that at his time, most of the remedies recommended uh, were far too strenuous that the patient not only had to recover from the ailment, but from the medication. And he advised the physician to keep the medications at a minimum so that the patient would have a chance of recovering from them. This also endeared him to everyone on a scientific level. Paracelsus has left a voluminous body of material of a literary form. Say literary with a certain amount of reservation, because while it is vastly important, it's by far no means a gem of writing. In the spirit of the times, it runs into thousands of folio pages with a great deal of repetition and tremendous linguistic involvement. At the same time, we cannot afford to discredit or disregard the author on this ground. As far as we know, he wrote nothing himself, but used his amanuensis, a man by the name of Oswald Crowley, who did most of the actual writing for him. He apparently dictated it, or Crowley gathered it from notes. The greater part of the Paracelsian corpus, or body of writing, has not been translated into English. Certain sections, with general appeal to special groups, will be found available, but uh, with one or two popular exceptions, even the English editions of his writings are rare. Uh, perhaps uh, the most available is the summary of his alchemical traditional writings and alchemical formulas and recipes, uh, which were published as the alchemetic and hermetic writings of Paracelsus, mm -hmm. translated uh, into English with an introduction, a note by author Edward Waite. And the most handy available work on the general philosophy of Paracelsus is the work of Franz Hagen, which is a summary of his doctrine planted uh, rather strongly in the direction of theosophy. Stillman's Life of Paracelsus contains extracts from his work also. And there have been one or two recent works 
which are essentially digests, selecting here and there uh, what may be regarded as choice fragments, at least in the mind of the editor. There are early translations in the 17th and a few in the 16th century, but these are almost as difficult to obtain as the original. Uh, the work on the sympathy, sympathetic medicine is available, uh, done in an early 17th century edition, but most uh, later printings. Uh, therefore, we may say that probably three quarters of the writings of Paracelsus are not generally available in English today, and are only accessible to manuscript copies from students or specialists in the field. Thus, we are not well equipped. Uh, to examine his medical formulas or his general knowledge. That he possessed unusual knowledge, we know. The reports of his cures are almost fantastic. He early developed a remedy for tuberculosis that apparently was comparatively infallible. He also succeeded in curing diabetes at a time when this was considered an incurable ailment. After his death, his body was placed in St. Sebastian's Church in a small German town. Here it remained for some time. Later, a monument was placed over the remains, and uh, the sick made pilgrimage to it uh, for centuries, almost as they might have made pilgrimage uh, to the Shrine of Lourdes. And uh, prayers at the tomb of Paracelsus are reported on two occasions as having prevented the, the plague from taking its immunity. What the truth is, of course, we do not know. But certainly his name was greatly admired and honored uh, in the field of medicine. Now, a person with his type of mind uh, would naturally do what Paracelsus did. Instead of attempting to separate medicine and therapy in general, from the total body of knowledge, he sought to restore it to the total body, body of knowledge. To him, to paraphrase uh, a more recent comment, the undevout, uh, his, uh, the undevout physician was mad. The Paracelsus religion was an essential part of medicine, not only of therapy, but even of uh, the inspiration or mystical overtone of prayer or meditation, or mystical intuitive apperception, which he considered to be invaluable in the diagnosis of disease. He next built his entire concept upon a concept of the universe. Man was part of a total pattern of life. Here he is moving toward his neoplatonic position. Um, man is not a separate creature, according to Paracelsus. And into the construction of man, the basic structure of the human being, uh, the Adam Prima of the Paracelsian viewpoint, the first Adam, or man, into his composition was incorporated everything which exists in the universe. Today we might scientifically point, it out, point out that most elements have been discovered in the human body. But man is actually composed in miniature of nearly every element, substance, and material in nature. And that therefore man is bound to nature by immense bonds of sympathy. And in another lecture of this series, we will study the, the sympathetic medicine or the sympathetic concept of Paracelsus, of a universe bound together as one living organism. Under this concept, sickness, was man's departure from pattern. It was man breaking away or separating himself or some part of himself from the orderly motion of the world. As long as the individual re remained in harmony with the total cosmic plan in which he existed, uh, he would be well. So the moment man attempted to separate himself, he was like a branch cut from a tree, destined to wither and die because he had separated his own personal existence from the great stream of universal life. Thus, the restoration of health is the restoration of universal motion in man, the reintegration of the individual into the universal harmony and order. 
And from that springs the series of philosophical speculations which constitute our first discussion this evening on the problem of natural and unnatural religion and philosophy. Now, in the use of natural and unnatural, Paracelsus is giving us a statement which is essentially based upon the early Greek uh, philosophy. Namely, that there is a nature according to seeming and a nature according to being. Everywhere there are things as they appear, and then there are things as they are. Now, in the Perisocian concept, it is man himself who has interpreted away from things as they are. Man refuses dramatically, continually, to be simple. He must look for difficult things, difficult explanations, complicated and confused methods. And in so doing, he departs from things as they are and becomes hopelessly involved in a collection of personal speculations. These speculations, continuing on through the ages, become tradition. From tradition, learning accumulates. From learning, science is distilled, and philosophy, and even theology. Therefore, man lives in a world of traditional knowledge, created by his own kind, and passed on as a heritage from generation to generation. At the same time, man lives in a world of things as they are, and it is his inability to recognize things as they are, which causes him to become enmeshed in the confusion of things as they seem to be. Thus the beginning of the Paracelsian concept of therapy was that all problems in nature are essentially natural. Nature, for example, is an orderly creature unfolding according to laws, maintaining patterns, proceeding in the sequences of absolute expectancy. Nature is seldom eccentric, seldom departs from its own rules as far as we are able to observe. And although we now talk rather glibly of a-causal factors, Paracelsus believes that there is no need for this that nature does not operate by miracles, nor can man. And he gives us his definition, that a miracle is an effect, the cause of which is unknown. But that cause must be equal in every respect to the effect which it produces. Therefore, behind all healing is an absolute pattern of cause and effect. Disease is a cause producing an effect. The various effects of disease are, in turn, causes for further effects, leading perhaps to the ultimate dissolution of the body. To recognize an absolute pattern of universal principles, to obey these principles, to compound medicines according to them, to administer these medicines according to natural law, realizing that even in the giving of drugs, there are seasons and times for all things, but medications given at different times may have different effects. The researches which he carried on therefore took him into the most obscure fields of knowledge. He spent some time in Constantinople studying with Arabic doctors and declared on returning to Europe that here, among the Arabs, he at last discovered men of scientific stature. He found men, for example, to use his own thinking, who reasoned for the effect rather than from them, and reasoned toward conclusions instead of from them. 
In other words, he found among the Arabs what he termed the scientific attitude of natural inquiry. The physician as a child of nature, observing with admiration and surprise the wondrous workings of natural law. The Arabs seemed to be delighted to make a discovery. The European physician was afraid to make one, because one discovery might topple over the entire structure of his learning. The Arab, having no traditional form, was free to take new ideas. He was not confused because science might conflict with philosophy. He was not afraid that his therapy would bring him to the, to the Inquisition or the rack. He did not have to worry about speculations concerning nature differing from the infallible axiomata of Aquinas or one of the great church fathers. The open mind to Paracelsus was best cultivated on the open road to go to where knowledge was, to sit humbly in the presence of it, not to care where it came from in the sense of the level, to listen to the humble peasant as rapidly as the most learned physician, realizing always that nature's oracles are everywhere and that man who would study the great book of nature, writes Theophrastus, must travel the pages with his feet. This wide search for knowledge placed Paracelsus perhaps at the top of the list of earnest and sincere men, not afraid to change his entire philosophy the moment he found a truth which conflicted with his own opinion. Whereas in Europe, the physicians were changing truths to conform with their opinion and were afraid to think. In the times of the great Hohenheim, a surgeon seldom if ever performed an operation, particularly if he was a learned man. He would sit on a large chair with a gold-tipped wand in his hand and a full medical regalia, ermine, trim, coat, and everything, and allow his apprentices to perform the surgery. And one of the earliest Caesarian sections in Europe was performed by a hog gelder. Bleeding was done principally by barbers. And the traditional red and white striped barber pole is the ancient symbol of the bleeding bandage. Barbers took care of surgery, midwives took care of obstetrics, witches took care of the poor, and the sorcerers took care of the rich. There was practically no ordinary available pattern of health. Health was comparatively unknown. An edict was published shortly before the time of Paracelsus, warning the people of Europe that to take more than one bath a year was to endanger health. Another edict was that you must sleep with every window of the house closed to keep the plague out. Plague doctors went around dressed like two plus clansmen with bundles of herbs on sticks hanging in front of their noses. It was an incredible situation. And into it came this incredible man who advocated the tearing up of all the paraphernalia, the discarding all of the traditional forms. He publicly burned the texts of Galen and Avicenna in a brazier in front of the college door and told the people and the physicians that the only way that they would ever find out what they wanted to know was to go out themselves, work with the sick, sit with them, stay with them, experiment with various remedies of a new or different kind, search for the solutions to things that have not been found, rather than merely to perpetuate forever the old formula. His 
Advent was therefore rather premature. Had he lived 200 years later, he probably would have been more welcome, if perhaps less necessary. But in his own day, he was a vital, dynamic factor. So we come to the Neoplatonic foundation to determine, if possible, what is the difference between natural religion and unnatural religion. According to Paracelsus, natural religion is the kind which we see around us and which is sustained forever by the evidences of law, order, beauty, rhythm, harmony, integration, everywhere obvious in the world. Natural religion has nothing to do with theology. Theology should be its handmaiden. Theology should take natural religion and press the search for the truth of it. The moment a dogma is introduced, natural theology dies. Because a dogma is a limitation, a restriction, an imposing upon the mind of that which may and will most likely limit the mind and close it to the observation of natural facts. Thus, we do not need any dogmatic factor as Paracelsus points out, to love God, to venerate truth, to serve the good, to do all things possible to keep the golden rule and the Ten Commandments. These things arise not from man, but in nature. The moment, however, we depart into speculation, we begin to restrict observation. We gradually substitute a kind of chemistry performed in the mind for the direct observation of the facts themselves. And as we do this, we inevitably depart from facts. And most of all, we depart from the great moral overtones of facts. We depart from the tremendous, rich message of religion, the facts themselves would sustain. As Lord Bacon observed, it is not necessary that God performs miracles inasmuch as the natural works of deity are more miraculous than any miracle we can conceive. Thus, the proof of deity lies not in miracles, but in nature, in the complete and total observation and reflection upon the thing as it is, the fact. Paracelsus became quite a psychologist and was one of the founding spirits in this field of research. He advocated constantly that the relationship be recognized between attitude and disease. He developed a philosophy based also upon Greek and other early sources of elementary. Elementaries are imaginary or unreal beings generated by the attitudes of human beings. Elementaries are therefore thought forms. We might call them complexes or phobias. They are creatures that have no life except the life that man imposes upon them or bestows to them. Yet man can nourish them and sustain them so that they become parasite-like creatures, attacking him, attacking themselves to him, and finally destroying him. Paracelsus pointed out that every unreasonable or irrational attitude of a human being, every destructive mood, every negative emotion, could and would produce psychic parasites that would drain his natural resources and gradually destroy his mentality. To Paracelsus, apparently, these parasites were beings, as false beings, homunculi, creatures created by man. Today we regard them not as living, but as thought forms 
or as complexes and phobias or fixations or frustrations, but perhaps we may sometimes find that he was right. It may well be that vitalized by man's own vital emotional mental energy, these creatures do assume parasitic proportions, attaching themselves to the mental emotional structure and gradually vampirizing it, destroying it. In any event, he was already working with this equation, the definite belief that the human attitude could result in the ultimate destruction of the body of man. It could result in the breaking away of the individual from the tree of life. Now, we have already mentioned the analogy of the branch separated from the tree. Man departing from virtue, integrity, honor, intelligence, common sense, any of these factors separates himself or breaks away from the common life of his kind. The moment the man declares war upon anything, he declares war upon his own life. The moment he segregates himself, the moment he takes the attitude of the Pharisee, that he is holier than someone else, what he factually does is to separate himself from the common stream of life. Paracelsus believed in the uncommon person, that is true. But he believed also that we are all essentially bound to nature and that we have a community in nature and that in this sense commonness is survival. What we share in common is our strength. In those things in which we are alone is our danger. Now man, as far as he is right, can never be alone. As far as he is wrong, he can never share with nature. Therefore rightness is community existence in harmony with natural order and natural law. On the level of philosophy, we have the same problem, natural and unnatural philosophy. Natural philosophy is that which appears sometimes as the strange intelligence of the so-called unlearned. Paracelsus had a profound respect for the unlearned. He did not believe that the individual who was lacking in academic training was necessarily uninformed. In many ways he believed that the person who had been spared from the corrupting influence of the curriculum was more likely to be intelligent. He was therefore deeply perturbed with this matter of what is intelligence. And he found intelligence in the dog, who having a sickness in itself, went out into the forest, found certain grasses, ate them, and got well. Now this dog did not have a physician. This dog had not been trained. This dog was depending upon instinct. And Paracelsus declares that instinct is a kind of sympathetic association between the separate creature and the total existence. That the individual who achieves to a high degree of wisdom restores his instinct. That we call instinct that has been purified, redeemed, and finally perfected and released intuition. And what to the animal is instinct, to man is intuition. Instinct is natural. Intuition, to a degree, has to be acquired. But it is not an acquired knowledge. It is an acquired sensitivity to fact. And uh, in the educated person, it generally results from disillusionment, in which to a long and difficult intellectual journey, the individual has come at the end, like Faust, to state that here he stands with all his lore, a fool no wiser than before. And having reached this recognition of his own folly, 
He becomes receptive. Paracelsus was very strongly of the opinion that man was never going to be able to battle his way to security at the expense of nature. His way was not of the conqueror. He could not force nature's secret from her. If he tried to, he would receive only certain fragments, and these fragments could be deadly. And wherever man ravishes nature, he ultimately destroys himself. On the other hand, the natural person, the simple person, following obedience, depending entirely upon an intuitive or instinctual apperception of value, discovers in nature an ever-present guide. But when man relaxes and becomes quiet, nature speaks. And it is the voice of nature and not the voice of man that is the authority. Man must therefore explore, as Paracelsus says, the three worlds, or the three spheres, in which uh, he will find the key. He tells us that deity, or universal power, has given man three keys, or three sources of information. The first, as would be expected in the time of the Reformation, was Holy Writ. The second, nature. And the third, the human body. These are the three great textbooks, and that the individual who can unite these gains the power of knowledge, true knowledge. He gains the capacity, and he must possess with this capacity, first of all, religious insight. Now, natural religious insight, according to Paracelsus, began and was established in the simple acceptance of the divine will as it is manifested in the divine work. Man, therefore, must have within him the capacity to take a simple attitude of veneration toward life. He must venerate the heavens and the earth. He must venerate the life in the trees and in the ocean. He must venerate the earth beneath his feet the sunset, and the clouds. He must venerate the body of the sick man with whom he is working. He must recognize the medication as worthless except for the divine power within it. He must realize that man heals nothing, but that God in man and nature doeth the work. The diagnosis is not merely from traditional learning, but from sympathy. That through great love and great understanding of the need of the suffering sick, we reach a a more or less sacred mood or attitude in which prayerfully we request, and in prayer we are answered. Thus, to Paracelsus, the whole practice of medicine began in the study of the universe, the tremendous harmonies and patterns which it contains, and the ability of the individual to observe, to seek for himself, to find no source too humble, no idea too strange, to be given proper consideration. To the original or basic instinct must also be added the next, namely experimentation. No remedy is proven merely because it exists. It is proven only because through labor, uh, through industry, through patient observation, it is checked and rechecked. Paracelsus was also one of the first to point out the importance of under-medication on the ground that it is possible gradually to increase the dosage if necessary, but that to begin with too great a dosage may do the greater ill. Therefore, in all his remedies, he approached the subject with extreme caution. 
recognizing uh, that the capacity of body to take certain medications differed with each individual and that what might cure one might be destructive to another. There should be a reason for this. It must be known and understood. And early in his researches, Paracelsus came upon a premise which undoubtedly has been fulfilled in the vitamin theory. He recognized the basis of all energy as being energy units, and that these energy units uh, constituted the nutritional factor in food and air and all of the essentials necessary to human life. Man did not live upon the carcasses of the dead. He gained no actual strength from the potato or the steak. These are not the source of nutrition, but they carry within them a nutritional unit. And it is this energy upon which the body must depend. And it is not that the food, but the sympathetic energy bound to it, becomes the basis of nutrition. The same is true also of medication. It is not the mineral medicine which accomplishes a cure, but the magnetic field of that medicine, which establishing a polarization within the body attracts energy. So Paracelsus recognized a universe of natural energy. He recognized reasons or causes why this energy could be cut off from the body. He recognized the moment the body was separated from its energy supply, the body was no longer able to function. Therefore, by obstruction or the interference with natural processes, the situation was established which led to disintegration, corruption, decay, infection, and things of that nature. So we began by taking theology and philosophy and interpreting them in terms of natural science, deriving all of his scientific principles from the basic concepts of universal harmony and order. We are not surprised, therefore, to observe that he, in, he involved himself in a number of strange theories theories which he had to examine. He also made a great number of discoveries which he was not able to explain. Later, one of the Paracelsian physicians, Dr. Kemelin Digby, in England, developed what he called a weapon saw. When a man was injured with a sharp weapon, the medication was placed upon the weapon instead of the wound, and the patient recovered. Now, this seemed to be an incredible and impossible situation. Paracelsus is so. There is a principle here somewhere. And through numerous experiments of this kind, he carried on his investigations of what he termed the sympathies in nature. Another interesting discovery that he made was that in certain parts of Germany, he observed the skins of animals that had been tacked up on the wall to cure or to dry after the animal had been killed. He went back day after day and found that the fur on the animal's skin continued to grow after the animal was dead. He observed also that certain stuffed birds in a museum in Germany continued to grow feathers although the bird had been in a cage, in a case, and dead for years. No one had noticed it, but he did. And he began to say, why is this true? He then made examinations of the bodies of the dead and found that beards grew after the body was dead. He began to study these things. There must be laws. There must be principles. 
there must be a source of energy available, and furthermore, things like the fur of animals, bird feathers, and human beards and hair must be separate living organisms capable of a degree of survival apart from the common body to which they were associated. From this theory, Paracelsus began to develop a support for his concept that all bodies in nature are compounds. That what we call a body is not one living organism, but is a multitude of organisms brought together under the sovereignty of a human will or a human consciousness. He found in this strong support for the older belief of the macrocosm-microcosm theory. Namely, that the universe was the great being and man was the little universe. That man himself was a cosmic system. That he had within his own nature miniature polarity for everything that existed outside of him and around him in the universe. Paracelsus was not much given to dissection. Perhaps he was too much of a Pythagorean, for the members of this school did not like the concept of the disfiguring of the body after death. But he was in the presence of physicians who were. And Paracelsus came to the conclusion that man was a complete functioning miniature of the cosmos. That therefore, each of these units could be interpreted in terms of the other. Each was a key to the other. If we could understand the world, we would understand man. If we could truly understand man, we would understand the world. Now, Paracelsus early observes that in viewing both the world and man, we view only surfaces. All we know of the cosmos is that which is revealed to us through some degree quality of observation, whether it be with the unaided eye or with the most powerful telescope or spectroscope. Everything that we know is through observation. Observation of surfaces. Our faculty perception cannot observe depth. And that which is beyond the grasp of the five senses cannot be observed. And as practically every important fact is beyond the five senses, man is limited by his faculties to a universe of trivia. He is limited to observe things in which the solutions or the causes are not visible, not apparent, and not available. Now, in the case of the universe, there are two ways of approaching it. One is scientific, the other is theological. Theological approach is entirely introspective or contemplative mystical. Scientific is entirely observational, physical, objective. Between these two, there must be a coordinating link. <laughs> this middle ground is taken by philosophy. Philosophy is forever trying to support the unseen by the evidence of the seen, and is forever attempting to demonstrate the presence of the unseen in the seen. In other words, philosophy attempts a rational explanation of the causes behind effects or of the causes in themselves in relation to chains of effects which may be dependent upon them. 
Thus, philosophy is the great reconciler of the seen and the unseen, giving man confidence in the invisible from the visible, making it reasonable to him that things seen are related to causes unseen. The causes in substance are theological, the effects are scientific, and the rationalization process of uniting them is philosophical. If, therefore, all of these analogies can be sustained, man then becomes a useful key to the study of all things other than man. And the study of all things other than man becomes valuable because it becomes a key to man. Thus all knowledge of universals gives us skill in particular, and all contemplation of particulars gives us an intuitive recognition of universal or generality. Thus Paracelsus attempted to reconcile the Platonic and Aristotelian approaches to knowledge. Now having this thought basically established that we have here natural science, natural philosophy, natural theology, we, according to Paracelsus, would say that natural theology is perhaps most completely revealed to the human body. And that in the functions of man, we have available to us a miniature world, near enough, understandable enough for us to comprehend. In order to study the mysteries of space, we do not need to go out there because there is no quality of space in space that is not in man. Everything we search outside of him is in him. And everything we find within him has its parallel, correspondent, or equivalent outside of him. Thus, in a competitively moderate form, we have not only the available textbook of man suitable for the understanding of nature, but also suitable for the perfection of philosophy and religion. While in Constantinople, it is quite probable that Paracelsus was in contact with the dervishes and other Eastern sects. It is quite also quite possible that through them he was introduced to a concept which is prevalent throughout Asia and which, of course, does underlie the Christian scriptures, although not so obviously. If you study almost any system of cosmogony in connection with the sacred writings of Eastern people, you will find that they are all based upon embryology, that the universe is always considered as a great body. In the Vedas and in the great Indic writings, the universe is said to be born from the womb of Miru, or space. And the entire creation is a form and developed according to the principle of generation. Thus, we know that ancient people, in the integration of their great concepts on scientific, philosophical, and religious levels, were primarily influenced by observation. Invisible beings in the atmosphere around us than there are visible ones on the earth. And that it is quite conceivable that these forms of life are separated only from us only by a dimensional screen. And that any power or ability to break through dimensional formulas might precipitate these lives into common knowledge that there are other dimensions of habitable earth, and that the earth itself supports many forms of life that we cannot see, and which may inhabit and occupy the same location as ourselves. 
but we never know them because of the qualitative interval between them. Paracelsus was therefore speculating rather dangerously for his time, speculating upon things which are just beginning to interest us today. But these speculations were not entirely original. They did derive almost totally from Neoplatonism and Gnosticism. On the same premise, man was an order of life, not merely cells within a body, but a vast government, a hierarchy of internal structure. There were not only gods in the heavens, there were gods in man. There were not only hierarchies in the universe, there were hierarchies within the organic structure of the individual. Thus, within the cellular structure, within the atomic and electronic structure of man, there was law and order, government, empire, republic, democracy, dictatorship, tyranny. Every form of relationship which existed in man's environment existed also within the structure of himself. As wars devastate the earth, so wars within the structure of the human body are sometimes called disease, and they may devastate vast areas. As storms may damage property, moves, tempests, tempests, hates, all these things are storms disturbing the interior atmosphere of man's psychic life. And just as surely as there is a uniting or synthetic power bearing upon the total world, so in man there is a self, a being, an entity, which occupies through the vast hierarchy of the human body the place that God occupies in the universe. Thus man as self, as being, as the master of body, must through its energy, or through its power, accomplish his own end. And man in turn, like God, becomes the source of life, the source of continuance, the origin and sustaining power of the entire structure which constitutes his body. Paracelsus would go so far as to suggest that perhaps within the human body, on dimensions we do not understand or realize. We can find almost the equivalent of religion. We do not know whether cells or atoms worship. We are not at all sure that the sovereignty of nature knows whether we worship or not. All we know is that man intuitively senses a power superior to himself and in this creates worship. Perhaps cells instinctively know a power superior to themselves. They do not know that power is man, and they do not know how to define it if they even experience it. So that to the cell, man is as beyond definition as deity is to man. But we have no way of knowing with certainty the meditations or reflections of these other forms of life. Luther Burbank was of the opinion that carrots have 21 sensory perceptions in comparison to man having five. Yet the carrot has never written an essay on theology. Burbank was regretful that it had not, because it would probably be better than anything man had written. There are conditions of knowledge which man does not understand. There is a possibility of knowing by fact, knowing inevitably, knowing without seeking to know, knowing by being itself. And we are not at all certain that forms of life without brain, without individualized structure such as we have in the human being, may not have a kind of knowing in which man is totally deficient because of the involvement and complication of his structure. So Paracelsus gives us one general pattern. 
His trousers have a universe with a sun in the center, surrounded by planets. He gives us a universe in man with a heart in the center, surrounded by the vital organs. He explains to us the mysteries of universal energy and of the physical nervous system of man. He finds two trees growing within man, the arterial tree from the heart and the tree of the nervous system from the brain. And he likens these to the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says that these trees exist in space, the planets, suns, moons, are fruit growing up on the tree of life, and that all forms growing up through nature are blossoms upon the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Thus from below, form is forever ascending. From above, life is forever descending. And wherever these meet, there is an alchemical compound composed of salt, sulfur, and mercury. Wherever the descending light and the ascending form meet, there is a compound, and that compound is called soul. And soul is mercury, the universal solvent, the reconciler of all op opposites, and the philosophic mercury, or the enlightened soul, is the regenerator of all metals. These things become parallel uh, to the great philosophic and theological conceptions of the ancients. So we find in man the same microcosm, according to Paracelsus, that we find in Flood and Meyer, the Rosicrucian author of the following century. We find again the same being that we find in the Cicerano edition of Vitruvius, the great man of architecture. We find men like Leonardo da Vinci in their great canons of artistic anatomy dividing the human body, analyzing it, proportioning it, distributing it upon the great black, uh, background of checkered squares to show its mathematical formulas, its harmony. We know in the theory of dynamic symmetry the infinite repetition of basic geometric forms in man just as we find them in plants, flowers, trees, ferns, and snowflakes. Paracelsus is observing all these things but observing them only with the eyes of the 15th century, or perhaps the very early 16th century, could not formulate them all into the scientific terms that we know today. But beneath the surface of what might be termed his wildest speculation, we see a tremendous dynamic, a vitality of original reflection, which is of increasing interest to us, particularly in the time of the development of a psychological approach uh, to life. In the problem, therefore, of natural and unnatural thinking, Paracelsus came upon another important formula, based once more upon Neoplatonism. Uh, we can say, perhaps following the words of Lord Bacon later, who was indebted to the same general school for his thinking, that it is better to accept all of the fables of the Koran and the legends of the Talmud than to affirm that the universal fabric is without a mind. In other words, the visible universe and the visible body of man, these bear witness inevitably to formal patterns, archetypes, which cannot be discovered in the body itself, which cannot be estimated purely by the objective faculties of man. Following the ladder of Plotinus, therefore, or Bacon's Pyramid of Pan, we can see the Paracelsian speculation, namely that the physical universe and the physical body of man both of these are suspended within larger, intangible fields of energy. The sovereign field of energy in which creation is suspended we call God. The sovereign field of energy in which the microcosm or the complete personal human being is suspended we call spirit. Spirit, therefore, 
is to man what God is to the total. Spirit is not only life in the sense of energy or vitalizing. Spirit possesses something with God, namely that spirit is conscious life. Spirit to Parasaltus was life knowing itself, knowing its own origin and destiny, and knowing its own purpose. Therefore, God is a purposed spirit. And the spirit in man is also, by nature and substance, a purposed being. For as it, as it is the purpose of deity to infinitely unfold itself through its creation, so it is the purpose of the human spirit to infinitely unfold its own nature through the composite constitution of man. Thus God grows up in the universe, and spirit grows up in man. Both come to age in their own creation. And when spirit comes to age in man, we call it maturity. This maturity, however, should never be confused totally with the concept of biological maturity. For maturity is actually release. When the life within a thing has a vehicle or instrument completely suitable to its needs, an instrument which in no way restricts or inhibits the life within it, then that creature has attained maturity. And whenever the, wherever the universe has achieved its full expression, it means that the light, the divine light, is given perfect and complete release. Now the total release of deity, as far as we can know, is the cosmos. The total release of the human spirit is in the normally functioning, adequately enlightened human being who has come as far as possible along the path of self-knowing and self-discipline. Thus, in the uh, Neoplatonic concept, the illuminated or the enlightened one is the one in whom this release has been achieved. Now man has certain indebtedness. In the Paracelsian corpus, man does not live in this world merely to protect or perfect himself. Because according to Paracelsus, self-consciousness or spirit consciousness in man is an essential unit within the total spirit consciousness of deity. Therefore, while man may be said to release himself, complete release of self is complete release from self, inasmuch as the total life is released through the total being. In the Paracelsian concept, therefore, regardless of the attainment of man, it is the universe attaining in man or through man. It is not man merely fulfilling himself, because man can never fulfill himself until the total universe is fulfilled through the total creation. Thus we have a tremendous, intangible, archetypal, causal nature, moving downward as the sand from the upper half of an hourglass. We have below the entire formal creation into which this sand flows, and in which it forms a pyramid-like structure that gradually begins to ascend. And as form ascending in all of its departments becomes more refined, more sensitive, more ensouled, it becomes an instrument for the universal expression of universal life itself. These theories, or these abstractions, have medical significance, or particular meaning in the field of therapy, inasmuch 
as they give us a new concept of health. Paracelsus said, health is not freedom from disease. Health is freedom from the cause of disease. Because you can get well at any moment and get sick again the next. You have no guarantee of freedom from sickness until health is empirically attained. The total concept of health is associated with a total adjustment of the individual being to the collective being. Each part of man must therefore have its due ratio with every part of the universe. An example will help to clarify this particular situation. Man is a composite composed of a number of other composites. Each of these beings is also both visible and invisible. There is not a visible cell in the human body but has an invisible counterpart. And the adjustment of that cell to its invisible counterpart is its health. Thus the cell is not healthy merely because the immediate cause of sickness is either removed or blocked. It is not healthy until it is completely normal. And normal means that it is in a condition in which there is no inconsistency between the cell and its own archetype. Man has an archetype. The archetype of the Adamus or the Adam Kadmon. The dynamic ADM of the Hebrew, meaning species, type, kind, genera. Man is archetypal. The archetype of man is the perfect man. The fallen or relapsed man, as Bailey calls him, is man fallen away from archetype. It represents the interval between the conduct of the individual and that which is necessary for survival. The fallen individual, therefore, has fallen away from keeping the pattern. He is divided from the archetype. He is not consistent with it. And because he is inconsistent with it, he does not receive its support. And Paracelsus goes back to the oracles of Greece and to the very ancient institutions to prove the point which he wishes to make, a point which perhaps in terms of our thinking he doesn't prove, but at the same time it is well worth mentioning. Paracelsus explains that among the ancients there were idols and images that were supposed to possess extraordinary virtues. These idols and images were created in the likenesses of deities. And not even the most ignorant individual in an enlightened period would assume for a moment that these stone, wood, marble, or metal figures were the deities any more than you could actually uh, convince a modern worshiper or religionist that some sacred image in his shrine, temple, or sanctuary is identical with the principle for which it stands. It is a likeness, a similitude. It is a representation of some kind. Now, Paracelsus declared that in the light of ancient sympathy, that if the image was constructed with magical skill, it became sufficiently similar to the principle for which it stood that a sympathy could exist between them. That this sympathy resulted in a motion of energy from the original to the symbol and therefore that a deity was not distant from an image magically and mystically composed bearing upon that deity. Pythagoras explained 
that in the orders of architecture, that the shape and columns of a temple, its roof, its dome, its measurements, its dimensions, if accurately made, would capture the qualities of certain deities because of sympathetic affinity. Things alike cannot be kept separate. Things not alike cannot be reconciled. Therefore, whenever a form comes into a harmony with an archetype, there is a release of energy from the archetype to the form which is consistent with it. The moment the form varies from the archetype, the sympathetic bond is broken and the energy is no longer recorded, although it may continue to flow. Following the Chaldean oracles of the Zoroaster, the energy fields were called ever-flowing fountains of universal good. Energy is everywhere, but it is all patterned, and the laws governing the patterns are geometrical and harmonic. Every pattern in nature has a color, number, a sound, and a form. Wherever forms create harmonic patterns, they attune themselves to archetypes just as two tuning forks of similar pitch. If one is struck, the other will sound. The same theory underlies television and radio, where certain sympathetic archetypes must be captured in instruments peculiarly suitable for that purpose. And if the instrument goes out of order, the patterns are no longer captured. Every form of life in nature, every energy, is archetypal. Therefore, it can only be released through a creature or being in which a sympathetic polarity exists. Man's uniqueness lies in the fact that within him is the sympathetic potential polarity of all things. Therefore, man is capable of knowing all things, being all things and attaining all things, because the roots and seeds of all things are within him. Actually, however, in function, man has available to him only such energy as can be held by the forms which he has created to capture archetypes. These forms may be of many kinds. They may be uh, metallurgical polarity. They may be nutritional. They may be ideas. They may be emotions. But an individual will never be able to energize an emotional power which is inconsistent with his own emotional process. Therefore, if he hates, he can never participate in the archetype of love. The energy is all around him, but he can't capture it. If he truly loves, he cannot be caught by the archetype of hate. It may permeate him, penetrate him, but it will not uh, find any responsive cord within him, and therefore will not be interpreted into his organism. Man is therefore surrounded and bombarded, perpetually and forever, by inconceivable energy of every thinkable and unthinkable types. Yet he only responds to those for which he has built polarities. As a complete solar system, he can build a complete set of solar polarities. As a psychic entity, he can build gradually, or according to his knowledge and understanding, polarities for all of the psychic or soul power of nature. And as a spiritual being, he can create centers for the dissemination of the spiritual archetypes of causation. Therefore, he can create polarities on the sphere of causation, means, and effects. 
And Paracelsus likened creation to the stars, means to the planets, and effects to the elements. And gives us a very careful study of all of these elements. So we see how the archetypal world of Neoplatonism, surrounding man and interpenetrating him, finds him somewhere in the midst of itself, a miniature of itself, but possessing within it self-will. This miniature self-will, or the right of the individual to do his own thinking and to be his own creative source of integration, organization, and motion. If this individual suffers from addiction to unnatural philosophy, science, or religion, and thereby practices irrational procedures on any of these levels, he cuts himself off from the archetypal energies of truth. He deprives himself of the natural function of these laws through his own denial or violation of them. Thus, as nature knows nothing except use, the individual who abuses breaks archetype. Nature recognizing only distribution, the individual who hoards becomes the miser of knowledge or of things, breaks archetypes. He deprives himself, therefore, of his distribution in the birthright of natural energy. Every negative attitude in some way blocks energy motion, in some way frustrates the distribution of a kind of power for this power cannot function through dissimilars. If then we see the great universe of spiritual, moral, intellectual, and physical propensities, observe man to be suspended in it, man as a miniature of it. The growth of man depends upon the creation of bridges between his own attainments and the universal sources of survival. Paracelsus was therefore of the opinion that what we might term physical immortality is not inconceivable. He did not believe it was desirable, but he said theoretically any creature that acts in absolute conformity with total archetype cannot die. And the universe, being the only creature that we know that acts in this conformity, comes nearest to, Im to immortality of all creatures. But because man is part of the universe, and because man disobeys, the disobedience of man can prevent the total immortality of the collective. Because Whereas the universe, on one level, keeps the law, its creations do not all do so, and therefore it is vulnerable on the level of its created forms. But theoretically, that which is totally wise, totally obedient, and totally good is immortal, because it breaks no law, and death results from the breaking of the contact between archetype and form. Now, in the case of man, the contact is not broken instantaneously. It begins to break at the moment of birth. A man begins to die the day he is born. The reason being that from the beginning of his life, environmentally, traditionally, in every other way, he is violating law. Therefore, instead of attaining to a maximum of efficiency, he attains only to a minimum of years in correspondence to the factors which have gone into the compounding of his organization. Man is always dying of disobedience. 
And this disobedience is either uh, conscious or unconscious. But between both conscious and unconscious, there is again a middle distance. And this middle distance is that if the individual becomes completely receptive to natural procedure, he lives whether he knows it or not. It is not necessary that he should know all things in order to be wise. It is rather necessary that he unlearns that which is not so. It is not the purpose or end, then, as we have said in other cases. The great end of life is not that man shall become wise, but that man shall decrease in ignorance. For what we call wisdom is absence of ignorance. Wisdom would positively affirm man's actual factual knowledge of cause, which he does not possess. Bringing this all down to a very practical level, and Paracelsus worked with the sick day after day, he came to the conclusion that the majority of sick persons were sick because, either through their own ignorance, the kind of ignorance which is negative, which is destructive, false practices. A kind of not knowing which leads to irrational conduct. The sickness is due to this irrational misunderstanding of natural law. That as long as it remains, the difficulty will remain. Man to be healthy must be virtuous, honest, normal. Gaining his insight of virtue from natural religion. Gaining his insight to virtue from natural philosophy. And gaining his insight uh, to normalcy and physical integration through natural science. In these procedures, he gains not necessarily an intellectual concept of heaven, but a factual living of a regime that is itself suitable to him. Paracelsus therefore points out the misfortune of the rich, where the only group well enough fixed financially to destroy themselves by their own excesses. He tells us that it is the individual who has too much who bears the greater burden of danger. The poor, living simply, are blessed by their own poverty. They must live on a handful of grain or the plants that they grow with their own hands or the berries that are in the forest. But because these are all natural, unprocessed foods, these people are fortunate. Whereas the person who is rich enough to buy the layer cake and the white bread is paying for his wealth with his life. Everywhere, it is the natural thing which comes the nearest to preserving value and making certain the person's integration into the cosmic pattern. Thus it was, according to Paracelsus, that in the Edenic paradise, Man lived without fear and without shame. He lived surrounded by the things of nature and he was given the power by God to name them according to their kind. He lived, therefore, we know not how long, in peace and tranquility, depending upon nothing except his contact with deity. Then, through disobedience, he fell into the state of individual opinion. And out of opinion came all other falling that man has done. For a falling is falling away from the law. Falling into human solution to divine problems. Human interpretation of universal truth. And by degrees, the substitution of human authority for divine facts. In the end, man becomes almost incapable of regaining the childlike simplicity of total consciousness. 
Paracelsus was therefore, he felt, more than justified in searching among the poor, the unlettered and the unlearned, for the simple homespun fruit that they knew. For he realized that in some way man had survived the age of ignorance only to die in the age of wisdom. That were, was man to survive at all if he lived through the prehistoric world. He lived because of a life that was non-intellectual, a life that was near to the archetypes of living, and because he lived absolutely simple never changing from the instinctive fulfillment of the impressions cast upon him by nature. He survived all of the vicissitudes of the ancient world only to build cities and die of the accumulation of his own filth. Thus, to restore this, Paracelsus believed that you cannot restore man to the primitive. You cannot take away from him what he has. You cannot make him non-intellectual once he has attained it. Therefore, you must now press forward to bring him across this terrible interval of false knowledge which separates primitive wisdom from ultimate wisdom. The individual must be brought from innocence to virtue from childishness to childlikeness. He must cross this bridge and through the voluntary surrender of his opinion must realign himself with archetypes, with the pattern of values. To do this, he needs a kind of education that he has never received. He needs to be re-indoctrinated with the sublimity of the natural world with the fact that nature is not a vast materialistic diffusion of potential profit and loss, that the universe is actually a magnificent living being capable of giving life in joy and taking it in punishment. That nature actually never punishes anything. It merely is man's own action, depriving himself of the support of nature. Nature never leaves man. Man departs from nature. God never rejects man. Man rejects God. Truth is never distant from man. Man absents himself from truth. Thus, through his own attitude, the human being cuts off his vital supply. And there is no way of restoring this supply except upon the three levels of the salt, sulfur, and mercury. And in this, sulfur is religion. Salt is science. Mercury is philosophy. These three must be brought into a compound to produce the physician. For the physician is himself the fulfilling of an archetype. The physician is the remedial power of the universe focused in an individual. In order to have that power focused in him, the physician must be a microcosm or a miniature of the total remedial process of nature. Here again you have your analogical pattern working back and forth. The physician who is only a scientist is not responsive to the archetype. He can pick up the archetypal level of science and progress it, but he is not a total physician because nature does not heal anything or preserve anything by material factors alone. The physician who is both a scientist and a philosopher has a greater participation because he now brings archetypal remedial agent of philosophy or reason as help into manifestation in his own career. But he is still only two-thirds the doctor. He must have the religious also. 
For unless he is able to attune himself to the spiritual causal archetypal phase of heaven, he will never be able to essentially bestow a remedy which takes into consideration and understands the consciousness requirement of the sick. Man gets well only through a remedy process which reaches all three of the essential elements of his nature, spiritual, intellectual, and material. Thus, the Theracosus, you will observe that certain physicians apparently have greater power with the sick than others. And here is something that we all perhaps can trace on another level. We have people who have, as you say, have green thumbs. There are people who can plant anything in the ground and it will grow. There are others who can work on it for months and it will promptly die. That little green shoot will never come, whereas another individual can accomplish wonders. Then there is another type of human being with unusual proclivities, and that is what is called animal man. He is a person who can control animals. There is absolutely nothing he cannot do with. He can put his arm or his head into the mouth of a tiger, and the animal will not injure him. The next person will turn on and kill instantly. What is the difference? Therosophus observing it carries it to the level of the sick. He says there are physicians, and when they enter the room of the sick, the patient improves. The physician intuitively seems to know what is necessary. I talked not long ago with the superintendent of a nursing school, and a tremendous amount has been learned about nurses, even today. A good nurse cannot take care of all kinds of sick people. Every so often, a nurse will come upon a patient who cannot recover with that nurse and have to get another nurse. There's nothing wrong with the nurse, as far as anyone can learn, and that same nurse, working with another patient, will gain a recovery immediately. The patient takes the nurse in the instant. Another patient will not. Many lives and critical moments have been changed by changing the nurse because of some kind of an intangible factor. Paracelsus says the world is full of these intangible factors. They're behind every uh, dose of syrup the doctor gives. They're behind every prescription. They're behind every time he takes a pulse or makes a diagnosis. He does not know what it is. Paracelsus says that is why there are born physicians and others who may become great doctors but will never be physicians, simply because of the intangible overtones. And that the only way that we can explain these overtones is archetypal. There is an archetype of a physician existing in the universe. The ancient guilds worshipped this, and they created the god of medicine. The de deity as the healer. The God of healing was God as the healer. God as the great physician. And this archetype has within it a very highly specialized group of requirements. Requirements of absolute sincerity. Of simple honesty. Of intuitive integrity, of instinctive ability, and tremendously of the keenest sympathy for the sick. This type of personality releases not only the remedial power of the archetype, so that the physician, as Paracelsus says, becomes his own greatest medicine something that is now totally ignored. The pills, the shots, and the poultices are now regarded as the instrument. Paracelsus said, no, 
The greatest physician is the one who carries healing in himself and releases it archetypally into the nature and body of the patient. That the physician who has this knowledge will thereby use a minimum of means outside of himself. These largely to prevent a critical situation or to appease one, or to remove an obstruction, or if necessary through amputation, to remove a gangrenous member that is beyond remedy according to the knowledge of the time. But that apart from that, the physician is only removing the inroads of an immediate danger. But the recovery of the patient, his psychological survival, his desire to get well, his instinctive cooperation with the physician, all these things are motivated by the energy field of the doctor himself. Therefore, the doctor is a kind of microcosm. He is a solar system of medicine. He is the physician and the elements and the alchemy and the vessel, all combined. And the power of his own healing, intuitive dedication not only makes his remedies more effective, but if he is these things, his intellect, his intuition, his emotions, his consciousness are correspondingly keyed. And he instinctively and naturally discovers the remedy becoming open, becoming completely dedicated to truth. He is no longer blocked by traditional knowledge or academic reputation. Let us also point it out very clearly that the end of medicine is not the justification of the physician, but the recovery of the sick. And that the honor of the physician, as far as his standing with other doctors is concerned, is absolutely meaningless and worthless. His only duty is the recovery of the sick. That is the only thing with which he is primarily concerned. And if he assumes this position, he is then bound into the archetypal energy of the principle or concept of medicine. God as the healing force of nature. And this healing force of nature is always pure energy. The healing force of nature is like the inhalation of air. It is the sustaining light flowing eternally from the great centers of cosmic vitality. And the physician becoming the agent of this vitality interprets it not only to the patient, but in his own functions, thereby becoming capable of the true practice of medicine. The same is true of the lawyer, the clergyman, anything you may conceive. The perfectly dedicated person, born with the peculiar and dominant gift to an art or science, whether it is music or literature or painting, this individual, true genius, lies in his adjustment to the archetype of his soul. The great artist is the one who has become at one with the archetype of universal beauty universal harmony, universal rhythm. These are geometrical formulas, and each one emanates energy. And these energies sustain the characters and characteristics and temperaments and dispositions of those who serve them. Thus constantly into uh, the life of man is flowing archetypal force, bearing not only life, but patterns. And man's great remedial opportunity is, wherever possible, to restore pattern, which means that he must know pattern. And having discovered what kind of a house this energy wants to live in, he must build his pattern. And if, as it says in the Bible, he builds his house according to the law, the living God will dwell therein meaning that if any human character or temple identifies its conduct with archetype, it then becomes a container or reservoir of energy from that archetype. 
man draws to himself that which is like his own total conduct. Therefore, if he is vicious, he draws viciousness. If he is benevolent, he draws benevolence. And whatever specialized aptitude he may possess, he draws the energy of space. For there is no special aptitude of man which is not archetypal, that is, which does not have its mathematical formula in space. This is the Neoplatonic background and places upon the position or upon all learning the concept of these archetypes which are true and natural and constitute the substance of natural religion, philosophy, and science. To discover and to keep the laws of the archetype is to survive, to advance, to grow, to progress, and to perfect. Any learning which is not archetypal or is contrary to archetypal can have no permanent value, no matter how tremendous it may appear. And learning which is away from archetype is always toward death. Thus, the Paracelsus now uh, gives us a material universe supported upon a magnificent framework of universal principles manifesting as radiant blossoms or archetypes. And whatever field you are in, that field is also a universe. Medicine is a complete cosmos in itself. Medicine is a microcosm of the universe. So is law, science, art, anything. And it is ruled by inflexible laws. And the practitioner is the one, the accurate practitioner, is the one who has discovered not only the visible pattern, but the laws and the archetypes. And is therefore able to cooperate. In alchemy, Paracelsus defines this as art perfecting nature. For art is man's skill. Consciously, assisting the manifestation of the archetype. It is man stepping in with his own individual mind, cooperating with the natural purpose, and in that way hastening uh, the parallels or the sympathies by which the archetypal energy is released. Man may not just wait. He may not wait until the ages builds that. He may build a house out of his wisdom and of his true knowledge. And by so doing, he draws the energy. And the same that we draw or think of God dwelling in the house built according to his law, Paracelsus says the physician writes a prescription. And if the physician knows what he is doing, is truly wise and truly enlightened, he will combine his medical elements, so that they will fulfill the curative archetype for an ailment. If such is achieved, then archetypal energy is carried by the medication. But if his formula is wrong, or the archetypal energy is not suitable to the ailment, there is no result. But the medical prescription, like the alchemical formula, is created to form a compound pattern of energy, an energy which, introduced into a situation, draws the curative power of the archetype by setting up a smaller miniature of itself in the body. And as every mathematical formula is equivalent to a chemical element, and every circumstance which we find in archetypes is fulfilled in sound, harmony, color, number, form, and in the concatenation of elements. So the absolute perfection of a medical formula is like the composition of a complete piece of music. It is a medium for the release of harmony to energy. Now this is a rather complicated theory, and we've carried it, I think, as far as we should in one evening. But we hope you will think about it and be prepared to go a little further with it uh, a week from this evening. In connection with the discussion of Paracelsus and the relating materials, we do have material about him in some of our own books which may interest you. One, of course, is our book Man, the Grand Symbol of the Mysteries, 
which has a section dealing with this theory, and also our book Pathways of Philosophy gives considerable information on the descent of the Paracelsian concept through the Neoplatonic line. We think you will find those books helpful in orienting the philosophy of Paracelsus if you are concerned with it. If you are wishing to consult early authors, I believe we have here in our library nearly every text in English available on Paracelsus, and we also have the complete edition of his original works in the first complete printed edition in German, done way back in the 1600s. So if you have any uh, ability to read low German, or have interest in further research, we suggest that you consult our library. Also, we hope you will visit the book table as you go out, and we also hope you will find on the table, if you're interested, a little tablet on our counseling service, and if you care to make yourself available of it, uh, we'd be happy to discuss it with you through the phone or in any way you wish. We are trying to help people in that department also, and we also look forward to seeing you a week from tonight when we will continue our study of the Paracelsus.